Hello and welcome to Path to Power, episode 14. I'm Matt Cooper. And I'm Ivan Yates. So we had great fun last week assessing the departure of Leo Varadkar as leader of Fine Gael and of course as Taoiseach. And we started our assessment of Simon Harris as the new leader of Fine Gael and as the presumptive Taoiseach. We'll continue that today. Lots of other things to talk about as well. But something I want to remind you of is the email address. You can get in touch with us at mail at path to power podcast. Dot com. And what we're going to do next week, given that we're anticipating, fingers crossed, that it's going to be relatively quiet politically over Easter, is that we will really deal with all of your many questions and comments in next week's edition. So keep them coming in, please. We're not ignoring them. There's some really interesting points, some great slags of Ivan on them, and we will address all of those in the next episode. But let's talk about Simon Harris and the fight against populism and deliberate polarisation. That was one of his key phrases last Sunday in his first major speech as the new leader of Fine Gael, to fight against populism and deliberate polarisation. Did anyone bother telling Michael Ring that, given that Michael Ring was up there saying, ah, oh, no more of this woke stuff, uh, no more of this hate speech bill, people don't want that. Is that what Fine Gael people want? They want the right to be able to be hateful in their speech? Well, um, uh, we discussed this before in the context of all these issues, whether it's the hate speech, it's not necessarily the detail of it, but might be, whether it's assisted dying, whether it's pub closing hours, whether it's transgender issues, all of these things are, to coin a phrase from someone that you don't approve of, uh, uh, Owen Harris, who says that the liberal agenda has mass support for marriage equality and, that, and the woke agenda is from NGOs and academics and doesn't have much support and is an irritant to the public. So I, I think what, what Michael Ring was saying was, you know, when he meets people in Westport, they talk about housing, health care, education, all the mainline public service issues, tax and business survival and jobs and investment and all that good stuff. And, and they want the narrative coming from the government, given that you're going to get into a more competitive airtime, they want to be on message on those things. So I, I put it like this. I think that, that Simon Harris will pick up on that. But of course, the great difficulty that Simon Harris, and this is why I said he inherited a hospital pass, he is in a straitjacket. One, the programme for government. Two, he has given a commitment to go the full term with the two other party leaders. So he is facing in two directions at the one time. One, to have a strident renewal of the brand of Fine Gael and at the same time stuck in this government straitjacket. But there's one other point on Michael Ring. He also brought in abortion. Abortion was overwhelmingly endorsed by the public. So I don't know what he thinks is to be gained by suddenly saying that Fine Gael isn't interested in issues like that. And I also saw that one of the um, recent exit polls in relation to the two referenda that were lost, that Fine Gael voters on both referendums voted for a majority yes vote. And then if you talk about the hate speech bill, let's not forget that this was overwhelmingly passed by the Doyle all but 14 TDs voted in favour of this legislation. Fine Gael was happy to put it through. Michael Ring was one of those who voted for it and Charlie Flanagan. Uh, and you have this situation now where they're trying to distance themselves from it, that they are trying to be as populist as Sinn Féin is. I mean, Leo Varadkar has in recent days criticised Pad Daly of Sinn Féin as justice spokesman for now doing what we might call Elisa Chambers on it. Having voted for it, to go through the Doyle, suddenly say, oh, no, no, we don't want that at all. But, but this isn't about the uh, detail, the granular detail. This is about the imagery. And, you know, even his first speech was about the broad brush strokes of security and, and small business and all that, that, that interesting stuff. But it's motherhood and apple pie. Like, you know, who is against enterprise? Who is against security? You know, these, well, are, sorry, these are core sort of central uh, issues. I'm sorry, we'll get to that because I think you can do all that at the same time as dealing with things like hate speech, because who is in support of hateful speech? And this, by actually Michael Ring and others in Fine Gael, are in danger of pandering to those who would polarise. They're in danger of pandering to those who are the latest protests that you see on the north side of Dublin, where I know somebody who was actually in his car driving through Coolock, and guys on horses 
were leading the campaign against this new uh, centre for immigrants to be put into. And they're all there waving the tricolours and they're sending small children out screaming hateful slogans. And are we supposed to be pandering to them, saying, well, we don't want to be doing any things like that. We want to be doing other things. And Leo Varadkar also made a very valid point in relation to it that Sinn Féin is flip-flopping in relation to this. How can you trust it on things? But how can Fine Gael issue those criticisms if some of its own leading lights are going down that rabbit hole as well? Well, uh, I think that, that what's going to happen is Helen McEntee is going to be moved out of justice and there's going to be a new message put out there about law and order. And what's meant by that is that people could walk the uh, streets safely at night in some cities and that the police presence and some of the basic fundamentals of dealing with criminal activity, whether it's the revolving door or whatever, even your own idea of a new prison, uh, all of that narrative. But we're now into into what is the brand, what is the image, what is the marketing. And he will have an opportunity, the Ardesh, to put more detail on it. But put it like this, I, I think that uh, post-referendums, people feel, look, we better just stick to the knitting here. OK, but there are other things that came up in his speech. And I was actually quite interested, And as we're coming into Easter Sunday, not the exact date, the Easter Rising, of course, in 1916 happened in late April, Easter falls early this year, but Easter Sunday gives us a time to think about things. And he reclaimed the flag in part of his speech mm. last week. Roars of approval. When he made what I thought was the quite valid comment about how obnoxious it was to see the killer Pierce McCauley getting buried in with the tricolour draped over his coffin. And it's led to some really interesting stuff over the last week in particular in relation to the pressure that the media is putting on Sinn Féin mm -hmm. in relation to the use of the tricolour. And various people condemning Pierce McCauley, but partial condemnation. And so he's not a Republican. We've distanced since ourselves. Owen O'Brien in particular was one of the first on Monday. David well Cunanan came out. David, well, see, there's a difference. I'm going to draw mm, distinctions yeah. here. Owen O'Brien couldn't bring himself, as to the best of my knowledge, to mention Garda Jerry McCabe. It was all about what had been done to Pauline Tully, who is now a TD, who had fallen in love with Pierce McCauley while he was a prisoner, married him on a day release from prison, never having met him before he went into prison. Then when he was released in 2009, famously escorted out of prison by then Sinn Féin TD Martin Ferris. Uh, he, then she discovered that he was a vicious psychopathic brute. He was ejected from the home. He went back on Christmas Eve in 2013 or 14 and nearly killed her, stabbed her 13, 14 times. Absolutely appalling, proving what type of person he was. And you can see why everyone in Sinn Féin would want to distance themselves. But they're distancing themselves because of that, not because of what he did to Garda Jerry McCabe. The only person who I've seen actually condemn the killing of Jared, Garda Jerry McCabe, interesting, Pierce Doherty said it was wrong this week. The others couldn't bring themselves to say it was So wrong. You're, you're saying they're con c condemning him as a wife beater rather than as a murderer of a cop. Yeah, and yes. then if you bring into it, you see Rose Dugdale, yeah. the British-born terrorist IRA, who had an appalling record throughout her life, did dreadful things, mm -hmm. including a homemade bomb maker, which was almost been celebrated at her funeral this week. And there was about a dozen... Sinn Féin TDs were there and Jerry Adams was there and people like your man Jim Monaghan from the Columbia Three who was her partner in later life. And she had the tricolour draped over her coffin. And I sort of wonder, do we need to be doing more to sort of reclaim the circumstances in which the tricolour can be used? I would have thought... So are you criticising Simon Harris or are you agreeing... Oh, I'm not criticising no, no, Simon no, no, Harris no, at no, all. No, about the content of his speech? Did you think it was a bit uh, light touch, vacuous? Or what, no, what was no, your take that, on it? That's not my point. And the point I want to get to with yeah. you is I thought it was an interesting thing, but I wonder what can be done about it. What can be done almost to mark Easter Sunday to reclaim the flag oh, rather than making speeches yeah. about it. Right. Because you would have been in government at the time of the murder of Gary yeah, yeah. McCabe. Yeah. And I think it might be worth for people to remember the circumstances of that because not only was that a horrific murder, it was took place, it was a robbery, an IRA robbery, effectively raising funds for the retirement mm -hmm. fund, funds of terrorism, or of terrorists. And then... There was all sorts of shenanigans entered into by Sinn Féin, wasn't there, to try and get these guys released early under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement. Now, admittedly, that was after you had left government. Mm -hmm. But just remind us 
of that well, time. Well, I have to tell you this because because you, you sent me a note about this uh, when he died the previous week, and my memory of cabinet was it was exactly I remember where I was when Veronica was killed. I have no clear recollection. I'm not I'm not in any way airbrushing or denying that you know to this day Desi O'Malley was fearless in his pursuit of that issue, and it is a touchstone issue the uh, cold blooded murder of any cop, but. I put it like this: it, it didn't have the same impact on the cabinet at the time that the Veronica, because the Veronica then, was about three or four weeks later. Yeah, so the the two together maybe were such, but emergency legislation was brought in by Nora Owen after the Veronica. So it could have been a combination. Yeah, when of the Veronica Gearn was killed, the, it's cab was brought in the criminal assets. Could I go in a different direction in relation to Simon Harris's uh, speech? I I think there are really acute challenges facing the nation. For example, the number of pensioners we have is 700,000. It's going to go to 1.7 million within a dozen or more years. What pressure will that put on the health service? Uh, We've got to build homes for an extra million people. We've got to keep all our industries going. And there's a critical shortage of electricity, of water and housing. And infrastructure is being paralysed at every level uh, I could bring you to. And, and someone needs to say, we need radical reform of the planning law or come up with some blueprint that will actually, other than throwing money at it, to deliver these problems. And I hear nobody in Irish politics setting out that real problematic in tray, which is, you know, when, when we're talking medium term, that is the key fundamental. If you want to sustain living standards, jobs, investments, that is, uh, you know, that's okay. where it's at. But see, do he pe- didn't mention it. But do people want real change? And I'll give you a couple of examples from this week where immediately where things, this change can't even be discussed. You've mentioned, for example, all the retired people that we're going to have, many of whom are going to be living in houses way too big for them. Mm-hmm. Already the SRI has identified that we're way ahead of ratios throughout the rest of Europe in that people have too much space in which to live. So you got the common situation whereby maybe a couple brings up their children in a house, three or four bedroom house. The children all leave, assuming they can leave and find somewhere to live. But let's assume that they leave. Maybe one part of that couple dies and you have a widow or widower rock, rocking around on their own in a three or four bedroom But how house. do you deal with that mobility issue? Well, this is this is where I'm going to come to. Nobody wants to discuss this. As I even discussed it, well, yesterday, we tried to do it on the last word. Mm. And immediately, the same sort of culture warriors are saying, you're communist, this is communism, this is trying to put people out of their own homes, all this type of thing. It's not actually. What it is, is looking for ways in which people have options. That if they want... Nobody's forcing them Mm. out of their homes. But if they wanted to trade down, that there is suitable accommodation for them. That they Now, there's a couple of problems here, though. One is that the banks won't provide bridging finance. So you might be in a position where you want to sell your house and you need the cash from the sale of the house to buy a new house. And you have maybe, hopefully, a nest egg left over for your retirement years. This is my plan, certainly, anyway. (laughs) But the problem is, is that... Where do you actually get something? And you might need to buy something before you're willing to sell your own home. You're not going to take a chance on maybe finding somewhere after you've, because you need the cash from the sale to buy the new place. Otherwise, you need bridging Mm. finance. You can't get it. Nobody's providing it. So that's one problem. The second problem in that is, is people trading down don't want to pay the stamp duty, which they see as dead money ongoing there. But the third problem is, there isn't enough suitable accommodation being built in areas where people live. And here's the rub, here's the problem. That every time there's a suggestion I know of for things like so-called quasi-retirement villages or accommodation of a right size for people, couples or single people trading down, they're likely to be the very same people who are objecting because they don't want new building in their area. So they end up trapping themselves. Well, I chaired a specific conference on senior housing and uh, there's a particular initiative in Dorky that is successful, whereby people have all the backup services, be it chiropody, close to shops, uh, close to... Well, that's for mass. the very well-off people. Uh, well, yeah, it? exactly. It probably is. But the, the, the point but about it is... This, up housing. No, yeah, absolutely. And also uh, in other countries, particularly in the UK, they've made huge strides in this. Could, could could I get back to politics? Because one sorry, of the, that is politics. No, sorry, that's government. <laughs> that's that's good government. That is performance. No, no, sorry, that becomes okay. politics because you, if you try and put in a new apartment block in any part of suburban Ireland, 
you will have all the local residents getting support from all their local politicians who will be turning up, let's save Dundrum or let's save... But that's a feature of the planning system that, like in, in Northern Ireland, only the first party is allowed to lodge an appeal. Yeah. So third party... But, but my point still is that it's still politics. But, but, you can't say but, it's just government. Well, so what I, was, what I was going with this is that it sort of crept into the ether now that the two party leaders, Eamon Ryan and Micheál Martin, said... Well, the condition of supporting Simon Harris, endorsing him as Taoiseach, was that the election would be in March 25. Um, I I just like to question that, Um, insofar as that uh, it'll be the worst time of year for the hospital trolley crisis. You could have homeless people in cold weather dying on the streets and you have what's called the politics of the latest atrocity. And they have no deferral option. They have no other options. Uh, And I, I actually think what's going to happen from the autumn on they'll be staying in office but they won't be staying in power because power will ebb away from them because people will know their mandate is up. And if there is now a clamour for a general election, what will it be like after everyone's done and dusted with the local elections? There'll be maybe the prospect of by-elections. I'm still of the view that your problem, which is the 5th of November in Washington and and Capitol Hill and the presidential election, is still problematic. Okay, I have been thinking more about that because I have to book my flights. Would you have a March election? Absolutely would suit me to have And I actually am now really coming to the view that it will be a March election. Okay. Uh, And the Well, that's what they say. Yeah, but the the most simple reason is is that, you know, you know yourself. You know, what was it the phrase? And was it Mary Herney or Seamus Brennan used it? Not the junior hurling one now. Uh, it's telling the coalition partners you're not Julia Hurling now. Yeah, yeah, it's Seamus Brennan. Yeah. But the other yeah. one wasn't it? Was it Mary Harney who said that the oh, the worst the, day the, in government is better, better than the best, best day in opposition. opposition. That's true, right? That's true. And I think that that's especially if you're at the stage that some of them are at in their careers. Exactly, yeah. and that's where Simon Harris is not going to want to be this short term. And for all the things that he wants to plan, rebuilding Fine Gael, and it might be a 10-year mm-hmm. job and all the rest of it, he still wants to be Taoiseach for as long as he possibly can be. And that's why I think it'll take us up until um, March. Oh, the now, narrative will be you can, you, can, you can run, but you can't hide. But you see, the narrative as well, I also wonder, and okay, the Green Party, and I, I'm, I'm very sceptical about polls and mm. all the rest of it, but the Green Party is still hanging in around 5 6% in the mm-hmm. polls, which might be enough to save quite a few of their seats, or it may not be. They might all get wiped out, which makes me wonder is how much does Eamon Ryan intend getting done in what might be his last chance? Oh, absolutely. I don't think he'll be in the next government. Yeah, and I so, think absolutely the congestion charges and other things. But uh, how much political damage is that going to do to the government parties in the local and European elections and then the general election. And I know he's trying to say, look, we're setting it back to all the local councils. They'll have to make the decisions mm. as to what's done. And that way get, rather than it being see. But I think the majority of people are just going to see this not just as a government-enforced diktat, but a green-enforced diktat. And a lot of people are going to be wondering, you know, how much is my how much benefit am I going to be getting from the large amount of money I spend on my car and on insuring it and paying my motor tax and filling it with mm. petrol or electricity? Well, well, the key thing about all that package of measures, so we've moved from incentives to get a million electric vehicles and charging points and all that infrastructure to now a series of, instead of carrots, sticks, right? So he did say to me last night on yeah. the radio, he still is going for that one million okay. cars by 2030, which I think I'd say 350. is impossible. Yeah, 350,000, I think. Yeah. But, but, but the, the, the point about it is this. He's now they're going with the stick. And, and you know, each time I come into this studio here, I pass by in Dunleary, uh, the road space allocation given to bikes. And I don't know, you don't get out much, but like there's been rain for three months and there's no cyclists in half of the road that's dedicated to cyclists. So m- my point is this. If you look at Bus Connects, if you look at Dublin's public transport system, Metrolink, there isn't actually the public transport network in place if you actually banned cars, whatever about congestion jars. And he is putting the cart before the horse. Absolutely the right thing to do. I'm a huge advocate of public transport myself, but I think he's putting the cart before the horse. But I actually think on migration, on RTE and on all of Eamon Ryan's agenda, people glaze over now. He's a, they're busted flushes. They're not regarded as having the authority. It's just done. And, and uh, I mean, we talk about the gap between real people and so on. But 
Uh, what's really intriguing me at the moment, because I want to talk about Independence Day later in yeah, terms of the 8th of June. Say, can I just come back to a couple of other things yeah, since yeah. Simon Harris's speech? And the reason I'm coming back to it is, is that we still need to know an awful lot of what Simon Harris believes in. For example, we have no idea really, to the best of my knowledge, as to what he thinks about Northern Ireland, whether he even cares about Northern Ireland. Leo Varadkar was the first Taoiseach in the position to talk about a united Ireland in his lifetime yeah. rather than pushing out. Leo Varadkar was somewhat reviled by many unionists who felt he was uber-nationalist. Now, he may not have got a credit from it from a lot of nationalists. And some of that was South. a Brexit fallout a as Brexit well. Fallout. Yeah. But we don't know where Simon Harris is on this. Simon Harris, and I'm just looking again at some of the key points from that speech he made last Sunday. Uh, he said that... Um, they would back businesses, especially small businesses, and that Fine Gael stood for, quote, making work pay, which isn't that far removed from getting from up early in the morning, morning that Leo Varadkar used to yeah. say, and then did very little about. So, so what is Simon Harris going to do? But, but that? given that, you know, even in Northern Ireland, the Minister for Foreign Affairs in charge of Northern Ireland is Micheál Martin. So there's not going to be a cigarette paper between Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil. There's going to be no deviation in government policy. And if he tried to, that wouldn't be. But I think there are two areas where he's going to use the reshuffle for optics. The first is to get Helen McEntee out of justice and either put her in European affairs or higher education or one of these. And I think that Heather Humphreys will go in there. The second thing, and this is speaking to your small business, I think... He is going to put a new broom in there in the form of Peter Burke and he is going to mandate him by the summer recess to come up with a package, whether it's VAT reliefs, whether in conjunction with Michael McGrath, uh, whether it's PRSI reliefs or whether it's direct mitigation measures to help them with their increased costs. And I think that, that, that that's, that's the direction he's in. The problem he has is... He only has two vacancies. He has Josepha Madigan at, at lower level and he has, he has Leo at the higher level. Now, to be honest with you, people are talking about how much blood is required on the floor to show that there is a new boss around here. And the feeling is there has to be at least one other member of cabinet to go and preferably two. So the process, as I understand it now, is that he is checking and double checking and verifying are you definitely standing in the next election and this brings us to Pascal and Simon Coveney and and so my ill-informed sources are telling me and have been telling me for some time that actually Coveney has something uh, of an offer from Google that he may actually have not a path to power, a path to money. And he he, he, he actually will be active. He, he moved to Cove out of his South Central constituency. Um, Jerry Buttermore is ready-made to stand by running John Mullins in the uh, uh, Euros. If he's not elected to that, he could stand in Cork East. So actually he could st- exit stage left. So I, I actually think, notwithstanding the fact that Harris organised Coveney's campaign, and there isn't particular bad blood with him. I think the requirement to freshen up the cabinet and looking at his options and appointing, you know, two or three new ministers within a narrow... You can't change the portfolios because Fianna Fáil, you know, that chair is already... Well, you can move right. On the Simon Coveney one, a lot of people are taking it as a bellwether that your old mate, your old co-presenter on News Talk yes. Breakfast, Chris Donoghue, left News Talk to go and work for Simon Coveney back, I think, in 2017 and has stayed with him no matter what department he has actually been in. He is apparently about to be appointed the government press secretary and that has been seen by people as a sign that he realises that Simon Coveney is not going to be remaining in Cabinet and this is him getting a new position. That's the way it's been interpreted. And I know Chris was texting you, as you revealed, on the morning of Leo Varadkar's um, resignation to fill you in. So what has he been filling you in on his personal Well, first of all, first of all, uh, Chris Chris was 40 last Saturday. I'm 64. And I... I, I, You're his father figure, right? Well, put it like this. I'm in, in my mind... I I have been keen to mentor him because he was full of the joys of journalism, a bit like you 30 (laughs) years ago. And I said, you know, I was full of the joys of politics and he now is a honed political animal. He has a very interesting backstory. And and this is honestly true. His, his, His mother died when he was very, very young. And before I joined News Talk in 2012, he had a a really serious cancer uh, and and he was surgery. And actually, 
I, 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 this is very unusual, but Dennis O'Brien took him under his wing and actually he was foist on me. You know, this cub guy, you know what I mean? I said, what in the name of Jesus? But actually, the kind of yin-yang of the old Victor Meldrew and the young intern, actually, and he was very good at the comedic stuff, very sharp nose for a story. Uh, and and he has, has put it like this, I think it's a great appointment. I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, but, but put it like this, he will, he's got full of energy and put it like, he, he, he's, he's, he's suitably, I've trained him to be devious, to be, de- <laughs> <laughs> went to apply the knife and to whom and how and to do the bloodless method and all this good stuff. So I, I think he is an interesting appointment and I actually think to freshen up all those appointments that Leo had, which is really regime change there. They're all gone. Uh, that that is, that is interesting. So I'll be watching that space. What was the question you asked me? Well, no, sir, I just wanted to talk about that. The other one, I suppose, let's get back to the Pascal thing because I think you shocked a lot of people with your revelation last week of bad blood between Pascal Dunhu and Simon Harris. I wonder where I got that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> is Pascal certain to stay in Cabinet? My view on it is, and this has nothing to do with any friendship with anyone, as I told you last week, I don't do friends in politics. I like to keep a distance from everybody in politics. But I think a lot of people in Fine Gael, a lot of the members, the ordinary members, might not have been too upset if Pascal Donoghue had become the leader on the basis mm. of the prudency and stability and, you know, sort of that he just doesn't give in to populism easily, that it's a sort of a pragmatic approach that he actually takes. But I wonder, you know, if he's been asked, are you standing in the next election? Well... Is he going to have to lie to keep his place in government if he actually is? Oh, I'd recommend it. Then? I'd recommend it because if he gives any hesitation, <laughs> he's gone. Uh, even I though d- Eurogroup and all that, no, that's that. I'm absolutely. I'm sorry, uh, nothing. The relationship that he has with Fianna Fáil's Michael McGrath. Yeah, I thought all of about that. Put it like this. The, 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 put it like this. The, the truth of it is, you're running till you're not running. I can say I'm definitely going to say this. Actually, happened to me uh, in January 2001. I'd already been selected for the election, which was expected to be in six months. Bruton was toppled and I said, you know what, I'm out of here. And so you can leave it and you can say, oh, my family have said this or I've had this offer or I'm not well or the circumstances. You can do it overnight. So there's no way you can compel someone to honour a commitment to stand. But the, the, the point about it is this. Harris is not going to be toppled anytime soon, I would have thought. It's a hospital pass. There are l- anyone who has expectations that he's going to gain the party 20 seats are not only naive, they're delusional. They're delusional. Wasn't it interesting to see that the likes of Brendan Griffin, Paul Kyo, all those couldn't be persuaded? To well, come- I have a little bit of news for you on that. I oh. hear Brendan Griffin. Um, Brendan Griffin is looking for something and it's not necessarily there. And they actually have another candidate in Kerry. But I heard who might be back is Charlie Flanagan. I heard that if a package was put together, he might be available. And I think that, you know, this old law and order thing and all that kind of stuff and the woke stuff and all that, that can mind tick that box. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think it's in the ether. OK, but isn't there a problem there as well in relation to the Gardaí? Something else that Simon Harris brought up was that they're on the side of Angarda Shikona where our streets are safe and crime is never allowed to go unchecked. Right. But Drew Harris at the AGSI conference this week was making the point that, you know, for all the government talk, and I'm paraphrasing this because he didn't criticise the government, but for all the government talk about getting to 15,000 members of the force, highest number ever, he said they need 18,000. And logically, that's what they need because the population has expanded so dramatically over the last decade. Mm. Yeah. We need well, it. you know what the I thing heard? Is, we're, never, we're not going to find them because a lot of young men and young women are thinking it looks far more attractive pay and lifestyle to join the police in Australia than it would be to join well, Garda Shikana well, here in Ireland and be struggling right. to find somewhere you're, to You're live. absolutely right there insofar as someone told me there was an agreed... Yeah, you got the letter. Join Templemore on the, the last day of the new year, uh, end of December. Just going to... 200 people, something like 57 turned up. That which echoes the point you're making. That but, would uh, never have happened in generations past. No, p- pensionable. My God, anyone to get into Angarda Shikana, they'd have been climbing over bodies to get into Angarda Shikana. So the people, I, I see, he has to get a balance with, with gender. I think Jennifer, uh, Carol McNeil could be the chief whip. 
uh, I think that uh, but that is, we will have an opportunity next Thursday to talk in more detail about this. I don't think he's made up his own mind but I think he will be focusing on the Enterprise Brief to do something and I think he will be focusing on the Justice Brief to give a gear shift um, along the lines of stronger law and order. But actually I think the most interesting thing in politics because I've actually been doing research on the local elections. Very good. It's very hard to get your head around this because there are 31 councils, there are 959 uh, councillors, nearly a thousand, and you, you think, oh, well, Donegal is different to Dublin and, and so on. So let's start with the scores on the doors. In 2019, which is the last local elections, Fianna Fáil did exceptionally well. They went up from the 2014 figure of 267 to 279. They got 25, 28% of the vote. And sorry, that gave them their confidence going into the 2020 general election and then discovered that it all fell flat on them. Uh, Fine Gael went from 235 to 255 on 25% of the vote. Now, what I'm going to tell you, Sinn Féin did a bad, they went from 159 to 81, next house was Labour, went from 51 to 57. So I could see the Sock Dems and Labour maybe on a good day getting um, uh, 50 seats. But what, what I'm now predicting, because I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of doing a pun on the word Independence Day, like the 4th of July, but I'm putting a TS in, instead of a CS, right? Uh, you're the you're the literate for the 8th of June. I am saying now, I firmly believe of the 959, over 300 independent councillors, non-party councillors are going to be elected. And 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 I, I, I've actually been looking at this zeitgeist, and I think it's the current zeitgeist, the same way Sinn Féin had the zeitgeist last year. And so what is the brand? The brand is all parties, including Sinn Féin, they put the party before the country, right? They put their career before their community. They'll do whatever the whips say and they're all out of touch. Whereas your local councillors are on the ground. How are you, Matt? How are you, Aileen? And all that kind of good stuff. And and so therefore, there is a resistance to top-down politics and a belief in bottom-up politics. Now, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but this is what I'm observing. And I, I really can see in the polls there is actually, because I think you're right, we're putting too much... Uh, emphasis on an individual poll. But there is a clear trend that, that Sinn Féin have lost a third of the support, which came from Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil because they've gone from the 20-somethings, right, down to 20 or 18 percent or whatever. And what's happened when it's disappeared from Sinn Féin? It hasn't gone back from where it came. It has gone to independence. And, and so therefore, I could see a situation that those 300 excess councillors, there's 43 constituencies in the next general election, and on the path to power, I can see 43 to 50 independent TDs elected. So what I think then is going to happen is, because first of all, the money system, you can't set up a new party, we've discussed this. You can't get donations right, from the private sector, from anybody, and you can only get money retrospect, whereas the independents get extra allowances, 30 grand here, 30 grand there, for different things that they can so put money into. So it pays them to be independent. In addition, they get more money to and, be And they will get pockets of okay, councillors elected. But sorry, does that then suggest, and I'm looking back to a general election situation, that some strong figure could emerge amongst the independents to say, coalesce and unite around me. A loose alliance. We're not a party. You're all still in. But you need a whip. You need yeah. a whip because you can't have a crisis every Wednesday night. There's a vote on Tala Hospital or whatever. So what I see sort of emerging is uh, Shane Ross put the uh, independent alliance with six TDs and a number, two senators and a number of councillors together. I could see something like that on steroids. So here is the policy piece. You'll hate all of this. Anti-migrant, anti-sustainability, particularly burning effigy of Eamon Ryan that feeds to the agri-community. Um, anti-bureaucracy, you know, we want local democracy and all that kind of thing. We want councillors making decisions. The other thing you love, back to basics, they'll be talking about, let's get rid of all the woke agenda and stick to public services, health and housing. And I think around that, they will form some form of charter. Now, Look, they can all be Belubas. I'm not saying, you know, because they are different and they're all Mayfainers, really. But I think the idea will be post-election from the pool of 40 to 50 to put something together, not to be a mudguard for one of the big parties, but actually to start displacing. And this comes back to Macron. If you look at Macron, um, and you're more travelled than me, 2016, he set up, was it on Marsh? It's now Renaissance. He has got two terms out of it. And he... 
he turned the, the Republicans and the socialist established parties into husks of parties. Could this happen here? OK, I just want to clarify that when you mentioned about burning the effigy of Eamon Ryan, that you are not advocating no, that please. because I don't want you to fall for you know the I'm new hate speech, on all the whole questions. hate speech laws that are coming in, <laughs> that you're not actually endorsing or suggesting no, that. Totally you're not. just saying that that would be what people might no, actually it's, it's do. It's a putative that, narrative. Yeah. Okay. See, you also said something last week which got a bit of attention as well in the uh, traditional media, uh, which was your report on doing the gig for Verona Murphy. Yeah. And you said, you reckon how many people were at it? I would put it like this, there were 600 seats and there was a lot of people standing. Okay, so that actually, if my sums are correct... It was more than the Labour Party. Had, more than, than the, the Helix. Labor, yeah, and more even than Fine Gael had at the European Parliament Convention. Which was well attended. Had, it apparently. was well attended, yeah. but you're talking about the new leader of a national party and the nominations for European constituency. Well, if the Healy Rays expect... wanted to get 700 people in a room, they could do it. You know, the, oh, what do you call they, that they, INEC they, centre? They, it's about 2,000 They could do it any time. You know, it, so that's time. not unusual, I suppose, to no, people travelling half though, the country. No, but it is interesting, though, doesn't it actually... Tell me, what no, do you sorry, think no, of my no, hypothesis? No, no, hold on, and that's what I'm coming to, if you let me finish. <laughs> because it is interesting that you are actually identifying that independents might be able to garner a greater degree of support in a constituency than a political party. That very few political parties could call a meeting now that would get the numbers like Verona Murphy actually delivered. And so what do you think of my hypothesis? Do you think it's rubbish? Do you think it's, it's like it is speculative? But I'm just I'm just trying to look well, at the polls Ivan, Ivan, and see where the vacuum is. You did say Fianna Fáil were going to get 60 seats in the last general election. So <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, ta- I take yeah. a lot of your okay, numbers. Okay, okay. But I do see the potential for, in every constituency at the general election, there is the potential for an independent to be elected. Which is 43. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you in relation to that. I always think with these things that these projections and have to be made far closer to the event because things change dramatically over the course of the political year and then they change dramatically well, during the course of an well, election. Well, let me put another question to you. Do you think, you know, if I was to reel off uh, some of the independent senators people from Catherine Connolly to Michael Collins, Richard Dunhu, Noel Grealish, Marion Harkin, Verona Murphy, um, Michael McNamara and Clare. Do you think, because you interview these people every day. Not do you, really, do you think, sometimes. Do you, think they are, do you think they have a homogeneous generic brand around which, because I've tried to describe it there, yes. anti-migrant, anti-sustainability, no. anti-red tape. I mean, it's the usual thing. Opposition is easier, isn't it? They can oppose everything. A lot more difficult when they actually get into power. Maybe is that why, with all due respects to Michael Healy Ray, who can be a bit sensitive as to what you say, maybe he's <laughs> going to be sensitive as to what I say now. But you know, when Michael Healy Ray had the opposition to get into power after the last election, he ducked it. He did. He you did. Know? He because did. it's far easier for the Healy Ray brand to be in permanent opposition. Rather than having but to as take he gets responsibility. Like, well, the temptation for these people is, OK, you have a secure seat, you're maybe a poll topper, maybe you have a few councillors, but are you at the cabinet table? But That's what Lord been, Ross He in. could have been Minister for Rural Affairs back yeah. in that 2016 onwards government. Yeah. The opportunity was there for him. And I think he decided his long-term political career was better off being a TD for Kerry rather than being a minister whose performance in the government could have undermined the position of the Healy Ray Empire amongst Kerry voters. So, so really what I'm saying is the outlook for Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil sorry, is will, worrisome. Will we, give, will we give Michael the opportunity to respond to that at some stage? Well, absolutely. Uh, but the, the, put it like this, the, the point is this. So I, I haven't changed my mind about the under 40s because... Asset price inflation for houses has been completely out of kilter with quantitative easing and everything else, out of kilter and supply and demand with income, you know, as a multiple. So this affordability gap has made them very bitter. They don't have a pension prospect, a lot of them, and they are not going to vote for the establishment bar. They even talk to you, some Irish sounding name is from a different era and so on. What I'm saying is that there's another flank of over 55s who will never vote Sinn Féin and who are absolutely now looking Looking, looking at this group of independents and, and, and could eat their lunch. Like, it's, it's very worrying for the two big parties. OK, maybe we'll call a halt unless there's anything else that you want to discuss today, is there? Had um, you anything else that you had wanted to get off your chest? Well, just, just on the migration question, one specific yeah. point I thought was a good idea. And that is this, that, as you know, we talked about senior housing. Another problem that's arising in the property market is we have 19% vacancy rate of offices. There are, it takes two years 
once you get your plan to actually build an office block. And all around us here in Ballsbridge, this is very visible. Working from home, these offices ain't going to be filled anytime soon. So whatever about the vacancy rate of 19%, now it's going to maybe double because of the glut of things that's irreversible, right? They're actually near nearing completion. I thought it was a good idea to convert those empty offices into migrant accommodation. What say you? Yes, absolutely. I think there's actually loads of buildings that could be very easily converted if there was a will. The problem is uh, often things move an awful lot more slowly in the public sector than they do in the private sector. And I know there's a lot of people give out about profiteering by the private sector and providing facilities and the state handing over. But the reality is that if you provide a contract to the private sector operators, they will actually do up the building and get it ready in double quick time so they can start getting the money in. Whereas if the state starts doing it, oh well... That will be developer-led. And also, unlike an old Georgian block, yeah. these are A-rated. In other words, they actually are convertible. Yeah, no, you get all sorts of issues in relation to as to how many toilets you have per floor. you got things about the height of ceilings and, yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. So it's not quite as simple. This is why this idea that they've looked at globally about converting... Uh, big commercial office blocks into apartments and stuff doesn't always work. Except There's issues that in relation there are logistical, to shafts. But, but what I'm saying is that there is the small like prospect of a little bit of a property crash in relation to these, the commercial oh, aspects of it I, and the debt and the cost of them and it's all stranded there, after working from home. Absolutely. This and is actually solving two problems in one go. There's an enormous amount of vacant land around the country as well that's been sort of cleared and nothing's going to happen it for a while. But we'll get to that maybe again. It would be better to see new apartment blocks been built there rather than uh, the office blocks that some developers have planned. But there are many, many buildings around the country. The problem is, is that the fear in the government now has that every time they look to sort of converting a building that you will get the yobs outside threatening to burn out those Can buildings. Can I do something to cheer you up? Uh, uh, sorry, I think I'm cheerful No, 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 to wind you up. I see John Waters is standing in the Midlands Northwest constituency with the support of Gemma, who is it, uh, your friend? <laughs> <laughs> OK, that is it for today. So what I am promising, because we are aware that we keep asking you for emails and that we haven't been dealing with them yet. So as next week we're anticipating, short of somebody else quitting politics, that it will be a reasonably quiet week during the Easter recess before the return on the 9th of April where Simon Harris will be presumably made Taoiseach and enough independence will support the So you can rest assured there'll be buckets of blood on the floor. <laughs> what we will do is we will go to many of your questions and comments and uh, see how that one goes for you in the next episode of Pass It Apart. So it's mail at path to power podcast.com is where you can send in your questions and your comments. So from this week, from me, Matt Cooper. And from me, Ivan Yates. Thank you very much for listening. Please recommend to a friend. You can get us at Apple, you can get us at Spotify, even on YouTube. And you know the great thing about YouTube is that even though it is visual, you don't have to look at us. You can just listen to the sound. Until the next time. <laughs>